Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's inaugural professorial lecture. I'm Liz Stewart, I'm the first Deputy Vice-Chancellor, and it's my pleasure this evening to welcome you on behalf of the Vice-Chancellor, who's very sorry she can't be here this evening. A particularly warm welcome to anybody who is here from outside the university. Inaugural lectures are a wonderful opportunity for us to celebrate our academic colleagues and their outstanding research. We're proud to be a university defined by research and teaching, driven by our values of compassion and particularly relevant for this evening's lecture, spirituality, with a focus on the value of individuals in this case, children. It's my pleasure to introduce Kate to you this evening. Particular pleasure for me because I'm Kate's line manager. <laughs> Kate is Professor of Education and Childhood and Director of Research and Knowledge Exchange here at the university. She grew up in Sutton Coalfield and is the eldest of four children. She was the first in her family to go to university and the first to get a doctorate. However, she was not the first in her family to publish an academic paper. Her father, an analytical chemist, published a paper on chromium in a scientific journal in the early 1970s. Kate's first degree was in sociology and law. She loved university and talks about her undergraduate days as the happiest days of her life, before coming here, I trust. <laughs> After graduating, Kate spent a few years working at Pergamon Press under the notorious Robert Maxwell. But understandably, she <laughs> yearned to get back into the learning environment. So she went to teach a training college in Scarborough and spent nearly a decade at a village school uh, on the Lincolnshire Norfolk border. And after a series of synchronicities, Kate moved back into academia to begin her research in children's spirituality. This started first at Oxford followed by a move to Glasgow, where Kate completed her PhD. Following this, Kate took up a teaching post as senior lecturer in education studies at BG in Lincoln. And during her 11 years there, she set up the EDD and became reader, professor, and head of research. We were absolutely delighted when Kate joined us here at the University of Winchester just over a year ago. Her main focus is leading the research and knowledge exchange here across the university. In this role, Kate is the driving force behind the university's research excellence, nurturing a values-led research culture and developing how we link our research and expertise into the community, national policy, and other external organizations. Kate, you're a hugely valued and important part of our university community, and we're endlessly thankful for the huge contribution you make to this institution. Please join in welcoming, please join me in welcoming Professor Kate Adams. Thank you, Liz. Welcome, everybody. 20 years ago, something a child said changed my life in a way that I really just could not have imagined. So I was a primary school teacher, and Mark was a nine-year-old boy in my class. I often don't have time to think, but on the days that I do have a bit of space for reflection, 
I sometimes think back to that day in what seemed like an ordinary day in the life of a primary school teacher. And I often think if somebody had been in that classroom at that time, someone who could predict the future, and if they'd said to me, Kate, this afternoon, if you listen to what Mark says, and then you keep your eyes and ears open for synchronicities, this is how your life might pan out for the next 20 years. And if they'd said to me, within a few months of listening to what Mark says to you, the University of Oxford will be giving you some money to buy yourself out of teaching, to go away and do some research. And within a year of that happening, a Russell Group University, the University of Glasgow, will come along and they'll say, that's fantastic research. We're going to give you a three-year scholarship to turn that research into a PhD. And if you follow those opportunities, within 20 years, you'll have published five books. And just a quick note about the spiritual dimension of childhood. In 2006, I went to a conference, the International Conference of Children's Spirituality, where I met or worked with uh, my co-authors, Richard, who I'm delighted is here uh, with us this evening, and Brendan. And we came up with the idea for this book at this conference in 2006. And the location of that conference was the University of Winchester. So in 2006, of course, neither of us would have imagined that all those years later, I'd be working here um, with Richard. Within 20 years, this mystical person would have said, you'll have written over 50 articles, peer-reviewed articles, articles for teachers, book chapters. You'll go on to influence curriculum policy. And other people will also think that your research is worth investing in, including the Church of England. So as a primary school teacher, if someone had said, all that will happen, I wouldn't have believed them. And that is actually only half the story, because they could have gone on to say, and then, over the next 20 years, you will travel the world, literally, paid for, working with academics from so many different countries. And it won't just be academics who will be interested in your work. The media will as well. I've been interviewed by John Humphreys on the Today programme. Expert comments in various uh, outlets. Vogue being my most glamorous one to date, but <laughs> we'll, see where, we'll see where things go. And there's an association that you haven't heard of yet, Kate, they would say. The International Association for the Study of Dreams. A fantastic organisation with members in over 40 countries. From artists to psychologists to neuroscientists. And you'll meet these people, work with them. You'll be a director of the association. And similarly also with the International Association for Children's Spirituality. And as an academic, as you will become, you will teach countless undergraduate students and postgraduate students, including supervising doctoral students. And my eighth one, my eighth completion, passed today, this very day in Lincoln, with no corrections. So well done, Louise. <laughs> so if someone had said that to me, None of that was planned. I wouldn't have conceived of any of that. And all of that would have led to me being here today. And I would say, well, what a privileged lifestyle and career that really is. So I'm very grateful to be here tonight, not as Director of Research and Knowledge Exchange, but as Professor of Education and Childhood. <laughs> And so I issue an invitation to you this evening. Specifically, of course, I'm going to invite you to see the worlds 
differently and to see the world through children's eyes. So there'll be three parts, the longest part, Unseen Worlds, where I'll take you into journeys of what ch children experience and say. The second one, It's Just Your Imagination, has a secret subtitle of Children's Disappointment in Adults. So be prepared for that one. <laughs> and finally, just a short uh, section on schools as spiritual spaces. Now, I will tell you what Mark said that set me off on this track. I'll keep, I'll keep you a little bit longer so you're not allowed to leave just yet. <laughs> so, Unseen Worlds. The only time I had a period of research leave was uh, to write this book. And it opened my eyes uh, through primary research and secondary research to all the different kinds of worlds that children live in alongside living in this material world. And I should just say that I'm talking about children from different religions, but I'm also talking from, about children who don't have any faith background as well. So angels. Across our literature in children's spirituality, we often see reference to children seeing angels. Very often, they talk about them as guardian angels. And if they do draw them or describe them, they're often uh, very much in the uh, traditional Christian imagery. But not always. Sometimes children see light. And sometimes children talk about angels as actual people, people they know. In our research, uh, one boy said to us, Guardian angels are with you on earth throughout your life. You can ask them to help you make right decisions or have courage to do something new. Each angel has a name and is assigned to you. Another really interesting area is children who see spirits of deceased loved ones, friends or relatives. Children often do this as if it's very natural, make comments to their parents, perhaps, that, oh, I've just been talking to grandma sitting in the chair. In our research, Ben referred to his deceased grandfather, who said, his grandfather still comes and sits on my bed, and we look at his watch together, a watch that his grandfather had left to him. His grandfather never said anything, but Ben just knew that he was there and was comforted by the fact that he could still see and be with his grandfather. Katie said, In church, the dead people you remember are close to you, but you can't feel them. You sense them. It isn't frightening because it isn't like a stranger. It's, it's in our family, like in your heart. Katie could sense one of her deceased relatives sitting next to her every time she went into the church. She said, my aunt comes to see what's happening on earth and she likes to have a rest in the pew. Imaginary companions, as they're now called. Some of us might remember these known as imaginary friends, but the terminology has changed because not all of these imaginary friends are particularly friendly. Studies in developmental psychology uh, particularly uh, look at these. And certainly some research like that of Davis talks about children who say, yes, 
I just imagine this, I made this friend up because I want some help with my homework or I want somebody to play with. But there are many other narratives of children for whom these are real people. And one lecturer I interviewed for my book, who's in her 50s, she remembers vividly to this day about two imaginary friends that she had when she was a child, a girl called Marjorie and a boy called Kicker. And they would often get her into trouble because she'd be walking home from school with her mum and Marjorie and Kicker would be behind and they were just dragging their feet. So the lecturer wouldn't cross the road to, to go home until Marjorie and Kicker had come up behind her. So she was always getting into trouble. I asked her when she stopped seeing Marjorie and Kicker and she said it was the day her family moved house and she said Marjorie and Kicker decided to stay in the old house and she never saw them again. But she swears to this day still that they were real. Now, we don't have time to go into children's near-death experience. It's not something I've researched uh, personally just through reading, but they are fascinating. And so are memories of ch children who remember past lives. So you will all be familiar with all of those, of course, which now brings us on to Mark for something a little different. So what was it that Mark said to me in that classroom 20 years ago? Well, it was an afternoon. It was a religious education lesson, an RE lesson. So we'd spent all morning doing uh, literacy and numeracy. And this was, this was where all the really interesting stuff happened, uh, I felt. Children, uh, Tobin Hart calls them natural philosophers. Children naturally ask all those really big questions about meaning and life. Is there a God? If there is a God, how do we know? If there is a God, why do bad things happen? What happens after we die? Children ask these naturally, and sometimes they'll find someone who can talk about it with them, but often, often adults are not, not quite brave enough to enter into those discussions. But I relish these in our RE lessons and always look forward to what the children would uh, come up with. So that afternoon, we were doing a lesson about people's beliefs about God, whether or not they thought God existed and why. And I taught this lesson regularly over the past eight years or so of being a teacher. And uh, first of all, the things the children said, I'd, I'd heard the answers before. So Emily said, I know God exists, miss, because you know when you hear the wind and the trees and the leaves, they're all rustling. That's God, she said. I know that's God. Well, Jason didn't agree. Jason said, that's not God, that's just the wind. And then Emma said, no, I know, why, I know that God exists. Because when I look up in the clouds, I see God's face looking down at me. So that's how I know God exists. So I'd heard those things before. And that's when Mark came into the conversation. And Mark said, I know God exists because when I go to sleep and when I dream, God comes to me in my dreams and talks to me. In ancient times, civilizations across the world believed that dreams were a means of spiritual enlightenment a means of communicating with the divine. Today, this idea remains embedded in a variety of religious teachings, 
as well as secular ideas about dreams serving as a means of spiritual growth. Whilst much is known about adult spiritual dreams, less is known about children's experience of them. However, children are no exception to making meaning from some of their dreams in this way, some of which make long-lasting impressions on their lives. In my dream, I was going down the hill in my road, where I live on my bike. And the bike was going really fast. Then suddenly, straight ahead was a tree. I was going to crash into it, but then I swerved and just missed it. Then I woke up. The next day, it really happened. It really happened? Yes, my dream, it told me the future. How did the dream do that? It was a dream from Ala. Ala was saying in the dream, this will happen. You'll crash into a tree if you don't swerve. Ala was warning me and looking after me. So the dream came from Ala? Yes, because only Ala knows the future. In my dream, I was floating in the cloud. I was crying. I was crying a lot. I couldn't stop. Then I heard God's voice. He said, don't be upset. How did you feel then? I woke up and felt a bit better and I stopped crying. Why do you think you had this dream? It was so God could show me he was looking after me. Did you tell anyone about this dream? Only my cat. He's, the, he's my only real friend. He always listens and couldn't even argue with you about anything. In my dream it was dark and suddenly I saw a light, all sparkly. It was a big angel with big wings. She smiled at me and said Nana was with her drinking a cup of tea and Nana was very happy. How did that make you feel? I was very happy because I knew I would see Nana again one day with the angels. She always drinks tea, but I don't like tea. It was a special dream. In my dream, I went back in time and I walked past a house with my friend and my family. I accidentally tripped and fell into the doorway. The door slammed shut and I was separated from my friend when the dream finished. Why do you think you had this dream? God gave it to me to warn me that my friend will go away f for a long time and that I wouldn't see her for a long, long time. <laughs> she was close to me and it would have been quite hurtful if she went and I didn't know about it before. So God sent me get to me because he was sending me a message that she was going to go. How did the dream make you feel? I think it was meant to make 
me feel better so I wouldn't be so upset when she moved away but it actually made it worse because I knew she was going to go and I kept thinking are you going to go and I started thinking about it a lot. Did you tell anyone about this dream? No, I thought everyone would think I was crazy, so I kept it to myself. If I, if I said God gave me a dream, all my friends would laugh at me. Two years ago, I had a dream. A man was praying on a hill and suddenly he vanished. There was no one there. Then I heard a voice saying, never let go of anyone in your family. That was the end of my dream. Who do you think the man was? I don't know, but I think the voice was God. The day before, I had a big argument with my mum and dad. They went into my bedroom when I was at school, but I had put a private sign on my door. They ignored it. I was really angry, so I wrote them a note saying, if you come into my room again and don't admit it, I will run away. So why did the voice in the dream say, never let go of anyone in your family? It was a, a reminder of like your mum made you so. You'd be very unwise to go away from your family. I still remember it. I tried to love my mum and dad more than I did then. Spiritual dreams transcend religious and secular boundaries. They transcend time and culture. They also transcend age, as these young people show. Yet they are often hidden from sight, easy to miss because they are short or because children fear ridicule or disbelief. And yet these dreams can often be profound, impact on their behaviours and beliefs and can be remembered for a lifetime. And many thanks to Rob for uh, creating that beautiful video for us. The, the children in there are actors, but all the, the text was taken from uh, interviews that I've done for my research. It's just your imagination. So how many of us have said that? Either to other people, to children, or maybe actually sometimes to ourselves, if we... So I think there might be someone in the corner of the room behind us and we turn round and we tell ourselves, no, it's just, just our imagination. You heard in the video there Paul who said his cat was his only friend and his cat was the only person he told until he met me as a researcher. And that's a very common message that we hear from children across many different studies. That they don't share their spiritual beliefs, experiences or thoughts, either because they have encountered ridicule or dismissal, or because they're frightened about doing so. And I found that that applies to children from religious families, as well as children who don't have that background. So these are some of the things children have said in my research that illustrate. So Lucy, when I went to her school to talk to them about their dreams, she said, I'd be crazy to tell anyone I had a dream about Jesus because all my friends would say I was mad. 
So I told my teacher not to tell them I was coming to talk to you. That peer pressure from other children is very common. Oliver said, Dad said my dream was my imagination, but I know it's real. Because when we use that word imagination, however we might conceive of it and understand it to a child, it is saying, you've made it up. It's fiction, it's fantasy. It's not real. But to children, all these experiences we're talking about were as real as you and I in this room this evening. Sanjit said, Mom's always too busy to listen to me about these kind of things. And that's normal, isn't it? In the morning, everyone's rushing, trying to get the children ready to school, don't want to be late for work, etc., And when you come home in the evening, everyone's tired. You've got household jobs to do, dinner to cook. And children often struggle to find that time with someone. And then Sophie said, I told my mum I see the angel, but she didn't believe me. So I don't tell her anymore. And that's one of the ways in which these worlds are unseen to adults because children don't talk about them particularly openly for all of these reasons. But this can have a long-lasting impact. I've also spoken to adults. And Matt was a teacher in America and he was in his 40s when I spoke to him. And he told me about an experience when he was a child that he remembered as vivid as if it happened yesterday. So one evening, he'd gone out into his backyard and he looked up into the sky. And he was just absolutely amazed. In the sky, he said it was like a picture, like a drawing of a city in the sky. And a city, he said, that looked like Jerusalem. And he was adamant this was not pictures in clouds. This was something really, really different. So he sat outside in his backyard looking at this in the sky, awestruck. And then his first reaction was run inside and get mum. So he runs into the house, mum, mum, come outside, come and look at this, come and look at this. Well, his mum was washing up, and she said, yeah, I'll be be with you in a a bit, Matt. And he's like, no, no, now, mum, now. But she carried on washing up. Matt ran back outside, only to find that it had gone. And his mum had missed it. He was a bit upset by that. But the next morning, he went into school. And it was show and tell. So the teacher, it was a religious school, and the teacher was a nun. And she said, so children, what have you been doing at the weekend? So Matt said, and that was the most stupid thing I ever did. I told my class and my teacher what I'd seen in the sky. And the moment he told them, All his classmates burst out laughing and started taking the mickey out of him. And even worse, his teacher laughed as well and said, oh, that's a good story, Matt. Stop making things up. And the impact of that moment on Matt was that he never, in the next 35 years or so, even though he was brought up in a religious home and carried on practicing his religion, but he never told anyone, never talked to anyone about his religious and spiritual beliefs again until, as I say, he met me in the context of being a researcher. So the impacts from childhood can be long-lasting and 
quite profound. So in a paper I've ju literally just hot off the press, about to be published um, in the next couple of weeks, I've used some visual images, four visual images, to look at the idea of spiritual spaces that children might find themselves in. And one of them is this picture, retreating into invisible spaces. So reactions like that drive, in a sense, spirituality kind of underground into the unseen, into the invisible, because people don't talk about it. Now, certainly sometimes, and this will be the same for many adults in this room, sometimes we choose not to tell people. So we choose to be invisible. And some children do the same as well. And that's, of course, what we need to respect. But sometimes... Not. So what can we do about all of this? So the notion of schools as spiritual spaces for some people might sound a bit strange, particularly schools that are not aligned to any faith context. But you will be forgiven if you don't know, even if you are a teacher. <laughs> that despite the wider background of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which gives children the right to expression, to thought, conscience and religion, our schools have actually had spirituality embedded into them for decades, way back in some form to the 1944 Education Act. And schools are required to promote the spiritual, moral, social and cultural development of children. And that is in legislation that's gone through several education acts. And that in itself is the envy of many of my colleagues and academics from other countries where it's not the case, where spirituality is only linked to religious schools. And that's not the case here. But what is spirituality? So I've only talked really this evening about a very narrow part of my interest, of children's spiritual experience, we should say. But the spirituality of children is much broader and covers many, many things. It's very much seen within our field as relational, about the relationship we have with ourselves, others, the world, and for some, a transcendent other. It's about that sense of feeling connected, knowing about one's identity, and that for children, of course, as we know, with all the mental health issues and other problems, is absolutely vital. Others talk about wonder, compassion, love, and that search for meaning and purpose in life. So those dreams, for example, that we talked about, children made a lot of meaning from those. The dreams themselves were very short, but when we talk to children about them, we see that they were much more to those children. So if you dream about your nana in heaven, that, for those children, gives them comfort. That there is a life beyond the life that we're living and that Nana is still alive. And not only that, but she may well see Nana again. It's about how people make sense of those big questions in life of meaning and purpose. And it is also important, and this is particularly difficult for teachers, it's what we, we call the dark side of children's spirituality. And by that, we mean that sometimes spiritual experiences and those kind of thoughts um, about meaning and purpose in life are actually frightening. They can be really unsettling. And we must avoid 
presenting spirituality as something that is all positive and all good. And, um, because sometimes children are frightened. Which puts schools in very difficult situations. Firstly, how do you define spirituality? Okay. Research tends to show that individuals tend to have an, their own understanding and then can articulate that quite clearly. But when you're having to try to create definitions for everyone, as Ofsted have tried to do for teachers, of course, getting everyone to agree to a definition is almost impossible. And sometimes some things can't be defined, which I think is the case here, which does not then make life easy for teachers who say, well, how can we promote spiritual development if we don't know what it is? And then we have the problem of that word, development, in this context. It's not like language development, which is linear and has certain stages. Is spirituality a linear process? I don't think so. And there are ethical issues as well, as Erica and Erica have said before. What moral right have any of us got to judge somebody else's spirituality? And then we have those cultural factors that David Hay termed beautifully the suspicion of the spiritual. And that's what we see today with children making fun of other children, adults saying it's just your imagination, off you go. But particularly uh, when my colleagues Janet and Ruth and I did a survey of initial teacher education departments in universities. And we asked them, how much time do you spend with your trainee teachers preparing them to promote spiritual, moral, social and cultural development, which is a legal requirement in the curriculum? The most, and only two universities said this, they spent two days in an entire teacher training course. Some of those were one-year courses, some of those were three-year courses. Six universities only spent one hour in an entire teacher training course, looking at all four elements. Well, you could spend a year just looking at spirituality. But of course, they don't have that time to do that. In a different study, Richard Woolley worked with student teachers at eight universities. And 44% of the students he spoke to said that they'd received little or no input at all on spiritual, moral, social and cultural development. And I'm just finishing some work now for the Church of England, um, looking at the concept of the whole child including the spiritual, and how we're in danger of that being lost in a curriculum that has been dominated by tick boxes. Because spirituality, I argue, is not something you can put in to a tick box. And so, unimagined futures. Let's just return to that idea. So my parents recently said to me that apparently I was a very serious child and my dad, as a scientist, has to have evidence for everything, so here's the evidence. But <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, maybe I was destined to be an academic and it was in my blood. But if I hadn't listened to what Mark said about his dream, I would never have followed the pathway that I had and the opportunities 
that came. So, what's next for my research? Well, I have some ideas, but I'm going to remain incredibly open, as I did 20 years ago, to see what might happen, what opportunities might come my way. But in terms of creating an imagined future for children's spirituality, I'll leave you with this thought. The foundations for creating future generations of adults who are spiritually nourished lie in our nurturing of children's spirituality. Because if we don't look after and respect children's spirituality and they retreat into those invisible spaces, those children are not going to grow up feeling spiritually confident, certainly in terms of being open about it. And so, I'll reissue that invitation to you to see the world through children's eyes. You may well think the things they say are imagination. You may well think they're making it up. It doesn't matter. What matters really is just that we respect what they say and listen when they want us to. And so, if you take only one thing away from this evening, perhaps it might be this. Think of those children like Paul, who only had his cat to talk to. He's by f no means on his own. And often children just want someone to listen to them, make that little bit of time. So, be the difference in that child's life, because they might not have someone else who will do that for them. Because after all, every single one of us was once a child. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. My name is Neil Marriott. I'm Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University. Um, I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening for a thought-provoking and important discussion. It's been a wonderful opportunity to hear from Kate and take on board some of her fascinating research in regards to children's spirituality. You always learn something new at an inaugural lecture, I find. And tonight I've learned that Vogue is a referable output, which is fantastic. <laughs> 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 uh, I, it says you thank you Kate but I'm going to add thank you Mark uh, for tonight's inaugural lecture and thank you to you all really for attending research whatever fields we're in uh, helps to, uh, us to try and understand the phenomena we know, know enough about uh, to try and improve our lot and our lives in some way and research in these fields is extremely important and we're very privileged in this institution to have colleagues such as Kate who are passionate about these subjects. I'd like to say you can welcome to stay and talk and discuss further uh, after, after the lecture. And I'd also like to wish you all, later on, a safe journey home. And dare I wish you sweet dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much, Denise.